science enthusiasts, my name is Jason Zakowski. I'm a high school chemistry teacher and science communicator, but I'm also the dog dad of Bunsen and Beaker, the science dogs on social media. If you love science and you love pets, you've come to the right place. So put on your safety glasses, do up your lab coat, hold on to your tail. <laughs> It's time for the Science Podcast. Welcome back to the Science Podcast this week. It's a busy week for our family. Um, the dogs and Chris and I, maybe Adam, <laughs> we are the guests at a awesome science night at Tell Spark in Calgary. It's called Spark After Dark. Uh, they have a bunch of uh, date stuff for um, couples on Valentine's Day. So it's it's ch- there's no kids under a certain age. Not that any of it's like X-rated or anything like that. It's just... Uh, for adults only, and we were asked to come with the dogs for a meet and greet, and also I'm doing this show, the podcast part of it, live. So I've got some stuff up my sleeve for that. I'm not sure when the live podcast will come out, probably end of February. So that's really exciting. We have Beaker in Agility, and if you were listening on Twitter, she didn't quite pass her level two. She tried so hard. She improved so much. Um, she's really close. So we're, you know, I, I, we love taking her to training. So doing some more isn't, you know, isn't the end of the world and she's going to get it this time. We know on the science podcast this week in science news, we're going to take a look at a robotic fish that was invented to basically stress out an invasive species. In pet science, we have a new study to break down that seems to conclude Cats' brains are getting smaller. Oh no, sorry cat owners. And in Ask an Expert, we have the bald scientist. Who is the bald scientist? Well, you're going to have to wait and listen to the interview. Hey dogs, what do you call a bunch of rabbits hopping backwards? A receding hairline. (laughs) I had to comb high and low for that joke. All right, I'm with the show. Because there's no time like science time. This week in science news, we have a very interesting, terrifying, cool story about using robots to stress out an invasive species. Now, a lot of people saw Flint the robotic dog on our feed because we got to go meet the Boston Dynamics robot with Bunsen and Beaker. Um, We're probably going to meet Flint again this Thursday, um, right the same day this podcast comes out. And there was a lot of people commenting that they did not like Flint. It scared them. And it was because it acted like a dog, sort of, but clearly wasn't a dog. And while Bunsen could care less about Flint, Beaker was a little bit concerned about that robotic dog. Now, there are these type of fish, getting back to the story, getting back to the story, there are these fish called mosquito fish. And they are incredibly invasive in the ecosystems from Europe to Australia. And they have very little predators that can take them out. They have a lot of food source. So as an invasive species, like the rabbit when it was introduced to Australia, they grow out of control and they take over the quote unquote native population of fish. So what did this team of researchers do? Reported in iScience on December 16th, they used a robotic fish to mimic one of the natural predators of the mosquito fish that wouldn't be found where this invasive species has now moved to. They stress in this that the robotic fish is not, this this uh, predatorial uh, robotic fish is not ready for prime time, but the study that they did with it is fascinating. Now, why and how do invasive species spread? 99% is because of humans, either through kind of, hair-brained, uh, silly decisions or mistakes. So the, the mosquito f- fish was released all over the world in a way to control malaria. Um, they thought it would eat all of the mosquito larva and then keep malaria down. But as, as it always happens, it seems, like the cane toad also in Australia, the mosquito fish just snacked on other stuff like frog eggs and other fish eggs instead of the mosquito larva. It did eat the mosquito larva, but it found other stuff to eat. Now, how do you control mosquito fish currently? The same way we control other stuff. Wildlife conservation traps them, nets them, might even poison them. And and it's working okay, but it's kind of like a blunt force tool. 
can definitely harm other species too in the effort to get rid of these mosquito fish. So the natural predator of the mosquito fish is the largemouth bass. And the robot was modeled after the largemouth bass. I think I've caught one of those things before in Animal Crossing. Anyways, <laughs> um, and what they found is that when this robot was in the same tank as uh, mosquito fish, they had six, 12 tanks that housed a bunch of different mosquito fish and also native Australian tadpoles, which are usually bugged by the mosquito fish, either eaten um, or harassed. And they found some very, very interesting trends. So in a nutshell, they had tanks of these mosquito fish with native species of tadpole that were predated by the mosquito fish. And then they would take the mosquito fish out and put them in another tank with this robot fish. And the robot fish was designed to lunge, <laughs> lunge aggressively at the mosquito fish um, if it got too close to the tadpoles or if it got too close to the robot. And after a week of doing this, there were some really shocking studies. And after five weeks of putting the mosquito fish in this tank for a couple hours a day, they found some sh shocking results. The mosquito fish were smaller they were slimmer and their sperm count was down. And even when they were in their home tank away from the predatorial robot fish, they acted more stressed out. So all of this stress, this cumulative stress affected the, the fish in measurable ways. So along with other conservation efforts, the team is hoping that perhaps these robotic fish could be anchored to the floor of a lake, river, you know, wherever these mosquito fish are and be used to constantly stress out the mosquito fish so that they are less fertile and maybe more stressed out. They have less, they're eating less too. So they're eating less of the stuff that they shouldn't be eating as an invasive species. Invasive species aren't invincible, but just like a supervillain, sometimes you've just got to find their weak spot. Maybe this robotic fish is like the uh, thermal heat exhaust to the Death Star in the mosquito fish. That's science news for this week. This week in pet science, we're talking about cats. Don't hate the messenger, though. <laughs> okay, so a study, the conclusion, we'll just get right to the conclusion. The conclusion is that cat skulls are shrinking. But how did scientists come up with this conclusion? And should we be worried? This study comes from the Royal Society of Open Science on January 26, 2022. And what the scientists did is what scientists do best. Take tons and tons of measurements and crunch the data. <laughs> so they took a whole bunch of cranial measurements of modern house cats and compared that to their closest wild relatives. And they found that over the last... Many, many years, 10,000 years, the house cat brain has shrunk. Now, does this mean, should we be worried? Should you care? Maybe you're looking at your cat and you're like, yeah, that checks out. <laughs> Maybe your cat is highly intelligent and shows it. Really just like some dogs. Um, some people are like, my dog is dumb as a sack of potatoes. Whereas other dogs are like, they got brains like a computer, like Beaker. <laughs> the prevailing theory is that tameness in cats compared to their rivals in the wild may have caused a down regulation of some of these specialized neural cells, which take up more space. Um, you may want those neural cells in a, if you're a wild cat, cause it gives you more fear, um, and more flight because <laughs> there's things out there that could straight up murder you and you've got to maybe catch more of your food than wait for your human to feed you. And and that may have played a role. There have been studies that have also concluded this. Uh, the, the study itself that I'm talking about referenced a previous study and done in the 60s and 70s that found the much the same thing, that the house cat brain has been shrinking. Does the shrinking of brains in domesticated cats hold up across other animals that have been domesticated? And changes in brain size have been similar in other domesticated animals like sheep, rabbits, and even dogs. The average dog head is maybe a bit smaller than some of the wild counterparts, though there are some head size to body size ratios, which is a little out of whack, where the head takes up way more of the overall dog's size 
compared to a wolf analog or a coyote or something like that. Do you have to worry that your cat is getting a little dumber? (laughs) The answer is probably not. And would you want your cat to be even smarter than it is? I'm sure some people are listening and they're like, heck no. My cat is plenty smart enough and it gets itself into all kinds of mischief. So (laughs) there you go. (laughs) That's Pet Science for this week. Hey everybody, before we get to the interview section, I thought I would just give you some ideas about how you could support the Science Podcast. Number one, you could support us on Patreon. Check out patreon.com backslash Bunsen Burner. There's multiple tiers of support, and the lowest tier of support is not much more than a cup of coffee a month. The second way is you could check out our merch shop. We've worked really hard to partner with clothing companies that do a great job of providing vibrant colors and soft feels. We also have the Beaker Stuffy for sale. It's so cute. The third way you could support us is giving us great reviews on our podcast playing apps. Any kind of review helps. And if you can't find a review, share our podcast with people. Thanks, everybody. Now back to the interviews. It's time for Ask an Expert on the Science Podcast, and I am delighted as we have Dr. Ani Pagan, who's a pharmacologist and professor of biology. How are you doing today, Ani? I'm fine. Thank you for having me here. (laughs) Your name came up from our listeners, actually, as somebody we should talk to. And the more I learned about you, the more I really wanted to pick your brain about some things. Where are you calling into the podcast from, Ani? Well, right now I'm uh, in Pennsylvania. I work at a town called Westchester, and that's about maybe 20 miles west of Philadelphia right now. But I'm originally Puerto Rican. Have you moved around the world, like from Puerto Rico to the United States? So and uh, I was a non-traditional student. I moved to the mainland when I was 35 for to get my PhD at Cornell University. And when I graduated, I was hired at Westchester University. That was almost 17 years ago. Okay. Um, and the other question I have for you is, uh, I mentioned you were a pharmacologist. You have a doctorate. What's, what's your training there? What's your education? Okay. So my bachelor's and master's degree, degrees were both from the University of Puerto Rico. My bachelor was in general natural sciences. I took biochemistry. I took astronomy. I took genetics. I took computer science. I couldn't commit. So uh, my master's was in biochemistry. And the PhD was in pharmacology with an emphasis on neurobiology. So it's, uh, yeah, pharmacology is essentially applied biochemistry, if you think about it. You couldn't commit to anything, but you must have enjoyed science. Uh, what, what got you into science? I love that. I always joke that I'm a mutant because in my family, nobody is uh, remotely attracted to science. And there was never any doubt that I will end on something scientific. Was there any one moment that pushed you into science? It, it would be as far as I can remember. I, I, I actually don't remember this particular story, but uh, my mother, my, my mom tells me that when I was maybe three or four years old, I asked her whether God created microscopes. Okay. I, I don't remember that. I, I wish I remember, but. She also told me that she replied to me, and I think it was a a great reply, that no, that God didn't create microscopes, but they gave uh, intelligence to people to invent things. And I think that that was a very good response to for a three or four year old kid. Oh, my goodness. Just enough to keep you curious. Absolutely. Uh, But without giving any definitive answer. I like that. Yep. All right, so getting right to it, one of the things you study is flatworms or planaria. And just for some context, I got a grant one year from the government and I ordered a bunch of planaria for my biology students. Oh, that's so cool. And the kids were absolutely fascinated by these things. So the kids had named them and they liked looking at them. And and when I saw that you have studied planaria, I guess my first question is, What did you study about them? Okay, so the the funny thing about it is that remember when I told you that I took a bunch of courses in the bachelor's? I never took a zoology course. So I came to Planaria through uh, an indirect way. So when I was doing my PhD, I was working on uh, an abuse drug, uh, cocaine, but in in a cell line, okay? 
And I saw a paper in which they gave cocaine to the worms and they became, for all intents and purposes, addicted. And I immediately went to my advisor and I said, we have to try this. This is a good model. And he actually said, no, because you no, know, he. Uh, I did my PhD in a hardcore physical chemistry lab. And he, and he was like, no, nah, worms, no. When you have your own lab, you do it. And that's precisely what I did. So, and th those are fascinating uh, critters because they, they are the kind of worms that many species, you can cut their heads off and they will regrow a head and the head will regrow a body. But even more interestingly, interestingly from my point of view, it's that they have a relatively complex brain and they are able to regenerate it in not only completely, but also correctly. Because imagine if we could do that, people with brain damage because of a car accident, uh, for instance. Okay, so that would be a, a awesome. I mean, a, and that's an understatement. But the thing that I use them for, it's to study addictive and toxicity responses to a variety of abuse drugs and try to come up with substances or medications that can take the worm out of that. Oh, so they were like an animal study application. Exactly. Thing. It's a model. Yep. It's a model. Yes. Did you have any successful findings? Actually, yes. I mean, I have the, the structure of a compound tattooed in my arm. That's dedication. <laughs> yes, because uh, uh, that, that was a kind of a convoluted story. But the cliff notes is that I tested that compound uh, when in grad school against uh, cocaine in the cell lines. And I tested them against certain behavioral responses in, uh, induced by cocaine. And it did work, at least in planaria. Okay. So the main idea that I envision it is more uh, against toxicity than against addiction per se, because addiction is such a complex phenomenon that it's very difficult to objectively study it in an animal. But toxicity, it's straightforward. Either the animal either lives or dies. Okay. And, and that's what, what we're doing. And another advantage of using it is that I, I wouldn't bring myself to use like rats, uh, uh, God forbid, monkeys, dogs. No, that's not me. I, I recognize the importance of animal research because that's main of, one of the main reasons why we, most, of, most of us are alive right now. But it's not for me. I'd rather work with invertebrates. Okay, that's really cool. Thank you. Okay, so my next question, may I may have got my facts wrong, but I've read somewhere that if you slice a planaria head in two, it will grow two heads? No, it will grow two heads. You can actually chop planaria off. Uh, uh, you, you can actually grow multiple heads in the same body. Yes, I've seen, uh, uh, yes I've seen pictures of People who keep cutting, cutting planarians, and it could it looks like a hydra, uh, something like that. That's a fascinating organism. Like, where does it keep the genetic information to repair itself, if not the brain? Absolutely. That's so wild. That's it's bananas. Oh yes, that that's a perfect description. It's bananas. I mean, I, I hope they discover it real soon. And. From your research, that compound on your arm, like, is that pushed on to the next level? Are you still working with that? Okay, I associated myself with some uh, electrophysiologists, and it seems to work on rats too. And, um, and we're thinking to try to move it forward. Uh, again, not for addiction. And, and, and I always uh, clarify this in, in, in an interview. I don't store cocaine in my laboratory. It's under lock and key. I don't have the combination of the, of the safe. It's very well regulated. It simplifies my life. So, Ani, my second question is about some of your writing. Um, you sent me uh, the piece of uh, literature you wrote called Drunk Flies and Stone Dolphins. Um, it's such an intriguing title, and I've been really enjoying what I've, been, what I've read. Could you talk to us about it? Well, it's uh, in a nutshell, it's uh, the idea that certain animals actively seek uh, psychoactive substances for either medicinal or sometimes even recreational purposes. So that, that's a very difficult thing to ascertain because it's very easy to personify an, an animal. And we cannot ask an animal, well, why are you chewing on that uh, fermented fruit? You know, but 
we, we are starting from the perspective that many animals share the same type of nervous system characteristics as we do. And actually, the origin of the book uh, was kind of the, the very research that I do with flatworms. Because uh, I've been in this popular science writing adventure for maybe eight or nine years now. And this is actually my third book. And when I was looking for topics, because I, I got the taste for writing. I, I love it. I didn't know that I was going to like it that much. And I began thinking about it. Well, why not other animals that can be intoxicated? And once I start doing the research, I found so many things. And it was so much fun that, that I just had to write them. Now, we never like to give away the plot of the entire book. Uh, but if you could tell us just a little bit about the stoned dolphins phenomenon, that would be amazing. Okay, so that's kind of the part of the book that that frustrated me uh, to write a little bit because, yeah, because I, I am fastidious when I write. I, I uh, It's probably because of my scientific training. I like to document absolutely everything. And if you see any book that I write, uh, it's full of footnotes, endnotes, references, and whatnot. And I do that for two reasons. I don't want anyone to think that I'm appropriating the work of anybody else. So that's I uh, documented everything as carefully as I, as I can. And I want to give the right information. Okay, so that's uh, my two main motivations. But the thing about the stone dolphins is that there's no scientific studies about that. It's, uh, it's anecdotes. A few years, yeah, a few years ab ago, a documentary crew went underwater to film a pod of dolphins. And they observed a pod of young dolphins passing along each other a, a puffer fish. So... They didn't kill the puffer fish. They would nibble on it and give it to the next dolphin. Nibble, next dolphin. Nibble, next dolphin. You can imagine what this behavior resembles uh, uh, to in terms of uh, uh, abuse drugs. So the people thought and hypothesized that they were getting high by some of the toxic secretions of, of the puffer fish. And that's not that far-fetched because... In people who like to eat the traditional Japanese cuisine uh, fugu, uh, they they like the tingling sensations that pufferfish induce in, in their mouths. It's the same tingling sensation that you may feel when you go to the dentist. It acts on the same type of nerve structures. So it may be that dolphins like that sensation. It may be that in dolphins, that toxin is psychoactive. Uh, again, it was frustrating to me, and I hope somebody's uh, studying something like that because I would love to see a paper about that. But it was too good of a, of a thing to leave it uh, out of a book of this uh, ilk, uh, as it were, uh, because it was so interesting. Uh, because you wouldn't think that animals would engage in behaviors that, I mean, they are kind of traditionally human. So like passing the bong from person to person. Exactly. Yeah, that, that was kind of the, the idea. Yeah. And and again, it's in retrospect, it's not surprising because uh, we share many characteristics uh, in the architecture of the nervous system, the, the chemistry of the nervous system. I, I mean, I it was kind of expected, but I, but I didn't know it was so widespread. And there's so many more stories like that in the book. Oh, yeah, there's plenty. You want to hear the one that surprised me the, the most? <laughs> We're all for surprising stories. Go ahead. Okay, so my, my most, the, well, one of the animals that most surprised me uh, was the story of the koala. Okay. <laughs> okay. You know, koalas you, are cute little bears uh, in Australia in, you know, nearby places. And they look like, I don't know, like a cute Winnie the Pooh type of thing, uh, you know? So, but uh, ever since the 1800s, the people uh, who colonized uh, that part of the world for Europe, they would write uh, Charles Darwin himself. And they would tell them, listen, I, I have a pet koala and they, uh, it steals my uh, tobacco pipe and to, to chew on the tobacco. And they uh, pull on their sleeves uh, when they're drinking, like uh, telling them, you know, give me, give me booze. 
and, and they would get addicted to alcohol and tobacco. What? Uh, 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 yes, I, I mean, and <laughs> it it blew my mind. It blew my mind that that people have been knowing these type of things for centuries now. And also, did you know that when a uh, fruit fly, the famous Drosophila of genetics fame, when male Drosophilas, they fail to get female companionship. They prefer fermented fruit as opposed to fresh fruit. So they're drowning their sorrows? When they when they get their, her, their hearts broken, they turn into drinking, just, just like us. Yeah, and this is this is something that, again, it blew my mind, but, oh, it's a very good opportunity to clarify a couple of things because in the book, I try to be uh, humorous, try to tell humorous stories in this, uh, in, in this, you know, style, but I'm not in any way, shape or form mocking addiction or mocking all the suffering that it entails. Uh, that's something that is very real. But if I can educate people, if we can educate each other, in what causes addiction, toxicity, all these type of things, it's bound to help someone. You know, I'm thinking if Pixar made this into a movie, it definitely wouldn't be G-rated. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> Where can people find that book? Well, it's uh, in any... Uh, actually, I'm very happy that I saw it on a Bar- Barnes & Noble, the physical book. Uh, I-, I got very geeked out by it. I saw it there. I know, I know it's at Amazon or directly from the publisher, uh, Ben Bella. We'll definitely have a link in the show notes to where your book can be found. Thank you. One more question before we get to our standard ones, Ani. Uh, you actually have your own podcast. You're a fellow podcaster. Could you talk to us about your podcast? <laughs> okay, so uh, that came about... Uh, because of the pandemic, because uh, uh, as many of us educators, I was teaching from home and I, I felt silly talking to a computer. I know it was the right thing to do. Uh, okay. But uh, the, I need the feedback. I, I love telling uh, dad jokes to keep them awake. Uh, 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 and I feed on, on their courtesy laughs, <laughs> you know, if, if you know what I mean. But then I was thinking about, yeah, uh, several ways to try to you know, occupying my mind, and then the bald scientist podcast was was born, and it's the bald scientist because well, I'm a scientist and I am hair deprived, uh, so that's. Uh, I I also have a blog which is baldscientist.com, yeah, and and I talk about uh, the byline is uh, science from the factual to the fictional, and sometimes a bit of both. Nice, I love that. <laughs> Thank you. Do you have a cartoon made of yourself? Like there's a comic strip of yourself? I do. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I love it. It's a very charming cartoon. Um, Ani, could you talk about one of the episodes or stories on your podcast that comes to mind? Like a memorable for one? Sure. For probably my favorite one, because the first few episodes were horrendous. I have to warn your your listeners right there because... I didn't. I didn't know how to edit. I didn't know. I, I'm no broadcaster, you know. I'm. I was just a, a bald guy with a microphone. That, that literally, <laughs> okay. So, but probably my favorite episode is like, uh, like ten or so steps that it took to publish my first book. Because I, I narrated the idea of, from where originally I got the idea. I would like to write popular science, and, and you know. Everything that uh, was born uh, from that, including the fact that I'm not shy when asking for stuff. My philosophy in life is, well, ask. The worst they can do is ignore you or say no. You know, I don't have an agent uh, still, but if you have a listener out there who's willing to, who's an agent, I want to take me on. Well, okay, I needed to say it, but (laughs) sorry, I'm a joker, but, you know, uh, I ask, I ask and uh, and that's something that it's guided my life. Uh, I try not to be afraid of stuff and I just do it. Hey, Ani, I forgot to ask this question of you. You've written quite a few other books. Could you name drop a few of them for us? Oh, sure. Uh, absolutely. My first book was titled The First Brain, The Neuroscience of Planarians. So, and 
it was published by Oxford University Press. So it's an, you know, it's ostensibly an academic book, but it's essentially a popular science book in which I use planarians as an excuse to explain brain science and pharmacology. So, and that's one of the examples in which you have to trust your uh, your editors and people because <laughs> the first title that I imagined for my first book was horrendous. And I'm going to tell you right now, I thought calling it the neuronal worm. <laughs> that, 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 that's a bestseller right there. <laughs> but, <laughs> but then... <laughs> yeah. So, but then one of the peer reviewers of the book said, well, the neuronal worm is not too catchy. Why don't you title it the first brain? And actually it fit, it fit because that was one of my points in the book that I'm arguing that planarians uh, possess the first kind of vertebrate style brain. Even if they're not in our direct evolutionary lineage, they share many characteristics. So the second book was titled is titled Strange Survivors, and that was published by, by my current publisher, Bembella Books, and it's about survival strategies that animals and other organisms have in nature, beyond paws, be, be, yeah. I talk about bioelectricity. I talk about venoms. I talk about cooperation. Uh, in, you know, I, I'm... I'm I, I, if you notice, I'm geeking out about these type of things because I love talking science. I love it. It's just wild how organisms keep themselves alive. And Absolutely. we'll have links in the show oh notes God, to those yes. books. Well, we're on to the standard questions of the podcast. And the first one is, and the first one is for our guests to share a pet story from their life. We mix science and animals on the podcast. Ani, do you have a pet story from your life you could share with us? Oh, do, do I? I have one that you're going to love. I have to pre preface it with the fact that I'm the prototypical husband and father who kept saying, I don't want dogs in the house. I'll never have dogs in the house. Then a certain delicious, delightful, I should say, not delicious, delightful creature called Ginger came to our lives. Uh, she's a standard poodle, and she's nuts, absolutely nuts. And at first, uh, because my wife called call me, I, I want to visit a friend, and they were, you know, I saw this puppy. And then yeah, she, I mean, it's not like she was asking me for permission as much as she was informing me that we were getting a dog, uh, it, it, you know. So she uh, she came back with Ginger. Uh, Ginger and I didn't like each other, uh, other at first. She growled at me. I, I growled back at her. Okay. Uh, but now she's mine. I mean, I take her everywhere. If, if I'm going to get, uh, I don't know, a Frappuccino, she goes with me. And, and they know her. And, 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 and she sleeps in our bed. <laughs> you know? and, and again, that serves me right for saying, you know, uh, and joke aside, I mean, we love her dearly. I mean, she's our puppy. She's 10 years now. And, and she's still a puppy. She's still a puppy. That's a great story. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> it's so adorable. You're welcome. We, 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 we love that girl. You know, that reminds me of the dog that I got in high school. It was my dog, but then I had to go off to university. So while I was home, I took care of the dog. But when, when I went to university, my dog quickly became my dad's dog. But, you know, it doesn't take that long for dogs to worm into your heart. No, they steal your heart. Yeah, I mean, even without trying. The second standard question, and I'm excited for this one with you, is we ask our guests to share a super fact. It's something that you know that when you tell people, it kind of like blows their mind away a bit. Do you have a super fact you could share with us? Uh, let me, okay, yeah, I, I have one for you. Did, you. did you know that there are certain types of marine snails? that actually hunt and eat fish. What? No. Well, yeah. There's snails. And, you know, there's no such thing as a fast snail. Uh, okay? They're slow snails. <laughs> you know? And they are uh, many species of what they're, they're called cone snails in general. 
and they are very brightly colored, many species, and the, their cone name is because their, their uh, shells, they are cone-shaped, right? But many species, they uh, have specialized venoms that what they do is that they extend like a little wormy, which is essentially a, a, like, a sle- like a tube, okay, that looks like a little worm. They wiggle it around, pretending it to be a worm. The fish goes to eat the pretend worm. And with, when the fish bites it, it gets stung with a harpoon. Actually, it looks like a harpoon when you look at it under the microscope and injects the fish with a, yes, with a, with a very potent venom that paralyzes it within a couple of seconds, which is also an advantage. Yes. yes. Oh, okay, okay, so I knew cone snails were dangerous, but I didn't know they shot harpoons at fish. I'm sorry oh, I interrupted you. No, 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 you. no. Not at all. It's, this is a conversation, man. <laughs> <laughs> um does it does the fish die right away like i heard it like it could kill a human like what happens to the fish no the, the, the bigger species yes yeah the bigger species they carry enough uh venom to to kill a human and there's been some fatalities people who are shell collectors uh for instance that they pick it up and they are not careful with it and the, uh, again the, the the smaller species can give you like a nasty uh sting like a bee or something like that but then again the bigger the bigger species can can kill humans and they're they're so interesting because there's some components of the venom that are actually used uh as medications for uh for example sadly there's some people with cancer for instance who ca- it can get very painful and the standard treatment against cancer pain is uh, morphine but the problem with morphine is that it causes a uh, habituation in a person. So they have to keep giving the person more and more and more until it begins to compromise breathing, which kind of defeats the purpose of uh, a medication. So they have used a component of cone, sna- cone snail venoms to generate like a, it's an, a type of analgesic, which is not related to morphine, that it's used for otherwise intractable pain. Pain. How wild is that? That that is wild. That is yes, a super yes. fact. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It, you know, I just assumed that the people who died or got in bad shape from a, a one of these snails like stepped on it, and the poison was on their shell, and it punctured their skin or something. Yeah. I, I mean. Yeah. I, I mean that. That's. That's what blows my mind when I learned ab- about those things some time ago. Uh, b- because, uh, again, who in their right mind would say, okay, that's a snail. He's going to harpoon me. But, I mean, nobody. <laughs> yeah, zero yeah. people. Zero people. Um, that That's terrifying. Imagine the evolution of that. <laughs> like, What if it just kept going and there'd be giant snails with giant harpoons? Oh, my exactly. goodness. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm gonna have to search uh, like some kind of YouTube video of the harpoon moving. Uh, I just can't wrap my head around it. I, I I can send you some links. Yeah. Oh man, that okay. Well, <laughs> we're at the last section of the podcast, and it's a fun one. We get to know our guests a little bit outside their area of work and what they study. It is the important to you section. Some guests talk about their hobbies. Some guests talk about causes. And Ani, you were going to talk about... Okay, so uh, we have three children. Uh, our daughter, she's the oldest, and she's 30. I don't know when that happened. And w- we have two boys, almost 24 and almost uh, 20. Our 24, uh, almost 24-year-old, uh, Reynaldo, he's, uh, uh, of course, I'm biased because he's my son, but he's delightful. I mean, he's the most delightful human being ever. Uh, alongside my other three kids uh, and my wife, for sure. Yeah, why not? Uh, I'm, I have to make sure that Lisa doesn't listen to the podcast. But anyway, <laughs> I'm a joker. I'm a joker. So, uh, uh, yeah. So, Reynaldo, he has uh, autism. And he, again, he's delightful. He's very social. He's very affectionate. He will talk your ear off about the Olympics, for example. Uh, you can ask him, when were the Olympics held in 1964? 
and he will tell you immediately. Uh, okay, so things like that. But he will also walk in traffic without giving it a second thought. Uh, uh, okay, so uh, that's one thing that I feel very passionate about, uh, not only because it's something that can affect the quality of life of not only my kid, uh, my young man, actually, but uh, of many other people, many other people. So uh, do we have time for a, for a short anecdote about it? Okay, because I... Uh, I do, I do, because I, I actually wrote a short blog post about it because I had a, a very weird dream uh, in uh, about that. So I dreamt that uh, the dreamt uh, the dream was in the future, because I went to visit my son to a, a a group home, okay, and in the dream he was middle aged and i must have been in my 90s because i was very frail uh, and whatnot so then an orderly came to the room and begins to treat my son very harshly i mean very uh, uh you, you know and then i stood up and confronted the guy and in the dream that orderly was a really big guy like I knew he was going to beat me up because I, I was 90-something. But then, uh, uh, to make the long story short, a couple more things happened. But when, uh, I mean, all of a sudden, I hulked out, just like the Incredible Hulk. But not green. But uh, did you happen to watch Game of Thrones? Do you remember the mountain? Okay, I became like that. And... I grabbed the, the orderly, I raised him, uh, and, I, uh, and I told him, listen, if you ever mistreat my child again, I will do something to you. I, I'm not going to repeat it in the podcast. Uh, I, I, I would be very, very angry. <laughs> okay? So uh, that, that's how I feel, because in many cases, people with disabilities are mistreated, sadly. And... Uh, thank heavens, my son still have us, but there's, for every person just like my son, there's a million who are on their own, probably mistreated by people. Uh, and I don't mean to be a downer, but these things do happen, and I would love to help, you know, improve the quality of life uh, of as many people as I can, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Um and that's a very thought provoking story. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I guess we all need to be thinking about others. If exactly. we do come in contact yeah. with somebody who has autism. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And if you run into someone who's a little quirky at a, I don't know, grocery store or that uh, talks to you in a funny way, of course, be careful, but don't assume that person is a creep immediately. Yeah. We only know about, others outside of our bubble when we talk to people outside of our bubble like you thanks for sharing that you also wanted to talk a little bit about the importance of having women in science in stem so i'll let you take that away yeah so i, I feel very passionate about that because don't get me wrong I, I like uh all my students and i want them all to succeed but historically uh women have been told by pretty much everyone you cannot do science. You're not smart enough to do math, okay? And there's nothing uh, like that. There's nothing further from the truth. Uh, girls, if you're listening to me right now, you can do science. You can do math. I happen to be married to a, a very talented medical laboratory uh, scientist. And, and that woman, my wife, it, she's way smarter than I'll ever be, uh, okay? So that, that's, uh, I want to state that right off the bat. So a second thing is that my very first research group, three girls that I'm talking about 2006 at Westchester. Today, one of them is a PhD in neuroscience. A second one is a nurse in a hospital. And a third one is a clinical neurologist. Okay, so how proud I am of those young women. Uh, so, and it's, this is something that it's very close to my heart because we, we need... We need more women in science. End of story. Yeah, you know, for the longest time, science kept out 50% of the population. More than that, if you consider people who weren't white. And uh, yes. Yes. just think about 
how much further we'd be if they didn't do that. Yes, yes, uh, I, 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 I am with you. Yeah, I want, I am with you one hundred percent. It's a great way to end our conversation, Ani. Uh, we're at the end of the chat. Thank you so much for talking to us about the wild and wacky and bananas, Planarian. Um, your amazing books, your touching stories about your pet and your uh, son. Uh, thank you so much for talking to us today on the Science Podcast. No, absolutely. Thank you for having me on. It's been my honor and privilege. Uh, uh, and again, uh, you're allowing me to talk science with a like-minded person. What's better than that, man? Nothing. Nothing's better. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey, um, can people, follow, uh, can people uh, yeah, find yeah. you on social media? Do you have an account to follow? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I can be reached at boldscientist.com. And my favorite social media venue is Twitter. I'm at Bold Scientist, uh, predictably, <laughs> you know. And uh, and again, uh, I'm always keen to talk science. So, uh, you know, contact me and I'll be happy. Okay, thank you. Take care, Doc. See you later. <laughs> okay, it's time for story time with me, Adam. If you don't know what story time is, story time is when we talk about stories that have happened within the past one or two weeks. I know I usually start, but this one is uh, because of a good reason. We have, well, I have adopted a cat. I have a cat. Um, Her name is Ginger. She has orange hair, which is pretty rare in female cats. I don't know why, but it's pretty rare to find a female cat with orange hair. Um, She is the sweetest thing ever. I mean, the dogs are very sweet, but when we were in the store, which is like Bone and Biscuit, and then there was, uh, she was there with Fostering Hope in the Bone and Biscuit, the store that we go to buy our dog stuff. Um, The first time that we went there, we were like, oh, she's so cute, and she was very, very nice, and then I started talking and asking about her, and then I said, okay, I will get this cat, and they said, all right, we'll put it on a 24-hour hold for you. And that's what they did. And then we came back today and picked up the cat. And she was very happy to come home with us. Um, most of the time, cats will be very, uh, cr- like they will cry in the car until you drive home. Nope, not this one. This one was silent. This one is so chill. Um, but yeah, we brought it home. And because dad has cat allergies, we brought it to my grandpa's house with Doc and the other cats. And she is doing very well amongst the other cats. Um, she's very... She's too chill. She's way too chill. I don't know. I don't understand. Most of the time, you'll have like a weird conflict with your cats when you bring another cat into the house. But no, this one's so chill. She just went around and sniffed everything. And then, yeah, she also makes very uh, cute meowings. So like when you pick her up, she'll meow at you. And then it's very cute. Um, Yeah, that's my story. New cat. Hooray. Uh, Mom, do you have a story? I sure do. My story has to do with the kindness challenge. It is still going very, very well. It's in full swing. And today what we did is we did some painting. Um, and so I tried something with acrylic paint and dog safe peanut butter and a Ziploc bag. Those were really all the supplies I needed and positive energy from the dogs because they really wanted to paint. And so I set it up and took some video, and it's super cute. I was actually really impressed with how things turned out. Yeah, they look really neat. Uh, That's my story. Dad, do you have a story? It's been a really busy week, so I don't really have any exciting stories like getting a cat or painting pictures with the dogs. (laughs) One thing that has been really fun um, is... I've been working uh, on some props and that means I've been going up and down stairs and Beaker is super curious to go downstairs. She loves going downstairs just to see what's down there. And every time she goes down, she finds a new uh, treasure to bring up and they're mostly Nerf darts. (laughs) They're mostly Nerf darts Um, because when the boys were young, they only wanted Nerf guns so we have like a, a giant Nerf collection of like busted up Nerf guns. Actually, I think some of them still work. Um, but when you have Nerf guns, you've got Nerf darts. And uh, yeah, Beaker keeps trying. Beaker keeps bringing up a Nerf dart. I'll go down to check my 3D print or something. And she'll be like, thump, 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 thump. And then she'll come and check stuff out because she's curious. Go see Adam and then go back upstairs. Um, whereas the basement is not really Bunsen's domain. He's only down there if Chris is down there. So 
not an exciting story, but kind of fun and funny. Um, that's the end of story time. Uh, thank you so much for listening to this part of the podcast. Um, I hope that the cat pic, like that, we have a couple cat pictures. Hope to see you guys next time on the podcast. Bye bye. That's it for this week's show. Special thanks to our expert guest, Dr. Ani Pagan, who talked to us about his studies with flatworms, planaria, and how some animals might seek out psychoactive substances. We'd also like to give a special thanks to our top tier patrons on Patreon. Without their support, we wouldn't be able to do what we do. If you want to hear your name, head over to Patreon and sign up. Take it away, Chris. Chris Kelly. Samantha Dodd, Kimberly Bond, Nate Stephenson, Debbie Anderson, Courtney Proven, Renee Hardy, Mary Rater, Shelby Leggett, Mary Coos, Katya Lynch, Marianne McNally, Andrea Persons, Elizabeth Bourgeois, Karen Beth St. George, Bianca Hyde, Sandy Brimer, Tracy Halberg, Jenny Jaguer, Leela Perriello, Lynn Armstrong, Lisa Sports, Catherine Jordan, Donna Craig, Lila Ashir, Jody Ogren, Liz Button, Kathy Zerker, and Ben Rather. For science, empathy, and cuteness. <laughs>